listeners, we're Ivy and Daria. Hi. Not so giant women. We're ready for episode 22, entitled Stephen and the Stevens. <laughs> <laughs> well, first thoughts on that? <laughs> well, it's definitely a band's name influence. <laughs> And it suggests at least some method of duplicating Stephen. I don't know if there'll be some new gem artifact which replicates people as well as action figures. Mm. Or if there is some other method for Stephen to form a band with himself. <laughs> or because this show likes to confound me sometimes, there might just be other people called Stephen. <laughs> What if they all spelled it differently? <laughs> yeah, it's a PH and an A and a... <laughs> well, let's find out. <laughs> Here we go. We are the Crystal Gems. Well, I stay true to myself by watching myself die. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I do like a bit of time travel. I know you do. So I was very much looking forward to what you would say about this episode. <laughs> <sighs> well, the first thing I'll say about this episode is what happened in it for the people at home. Uh, we yes. join, we join Stephen and the Gems as they are in a quite nicely designed undersea facility of some kind, filled yes. with hourglass and hourglass-like items. They are looking for a particular time artifact. They have differing opinions as to which one it would be of the many varying sizes and shapes of hourglassian things around them. <laughs> Stephen happens upon one which viewers like us will recognise the time thing from the pilot. So right. what with the pilot not being canon, it means that the time thing can end up here. Who knows? Maybe something like what we see in this episode is means that why the pilot no didn't actually happen. Anyway, Amethyst finds a quote, janky looking hourglass, and I've got to say it is a pretty neat sculpture, and her removing it starts the whole complex collapsing because that, that's how hourglass holes work, I suppose. Water starts gushing in and they have to get to the warp pad thinking their mission is unfulfilled. However, while they bicker about this, Stephen has to go to Beach Palooza, which is a local music festival where the whole town will turn up, which, as Greg will later note, is only about 15 people. He is intending to play with his dad, uh, One Hit Wonder Greg Universe, but Greg has been waylaid at the car wash because Onion's dad, uh, still speaking what I'm now going to call Onion Speak, has <laughs> got it has got his boat stuck in the car wash because, well, it's a boat and it's, quote, too fat for a car wash. <laughs> Greg has to apologise for Stephen that he can't do Beach to Palooza because he's dealing with the fat boat. Stephen wishes he could have warned Greg not to let the fat boat into the car wash and as soon as he does this, the time thing takes him back to earlier that day when the boat was being let in and gives Stephen the opportunity to warn Greg, who then stops. The subsequent discussion between Greg and Onion Senior re results in the truck of the boat, the truck hauling the boat, rolls forward, hits a power line, which collapses onto the car wash and starts a fire. Stephen now wishes he could tell himself not to warn his, his dad of what's happening and this the time thing obeys it takes him back a couple of minutes to what we just saw significant difference between this and the pilot version is when he travels back in time to where he already was he encounters himself rather than sort of replacing or quantum leaping into himself or whatever so there are now two stevens the slightly younger steven recognizes the other as future steven immediately he's either genre savvy or incredibly random <laughs> they they discuss the problem, decide not to warn Greg. They realize, they, excuse me, they come to the idea that they can be each, each other's band for Beta Palooza. They travel back again to 
get a third and fourth Stephen to act as the various members of the band. We see a nice song which just so trying for a genre analysis. This is exactly what Stephen does later in the show. It is a happy tribute to the days of early rock. He's spot on with that. So, you know, I, I couldn't have spent all that time in my head. I could have not spent all that time in my head trying to phrase it best. I should have just waited for the characters to do so. After we see this musical number, which is, I guess, them rehearsing, one of the Stevens, they have a debate about who's going to be the band leader. They figure it's going to be, it should be the Steven who's been around the longest, which presumably was the one who traveled back the most from furthest to it. On a pretty thin difference here, it must be said, but this Stephen, you should call him Stephen 1, dubs the others Stephen 2, 3, and 4, and that they shall be, I remember, the, the intelligent one, the funny one, and the sensitive one, and he will be the handsome one as Stephen 1 quiffs his hair into a Leningrad Cowboys-esque do. <laughs> he also... The other Stevens also have numbers drawn on their faces so we can tell which is which. Stephen one is unhappy that the other three Stevens are not playing their assigned roles as funny, sensitive, and intelligent. Well, he's, when he steps out to think about this, with some birds surrounding him, indicating another possible inspiration for his hair, hairdo being the flock of seagulls, he <laughs> returns to find that the... Remaining Stevens, two, three, and four, have decided to kick him out of the band and start making angsty numbers about how he made them feel bad. Time travel hijinks start to ensue because Stephen one wants to undo having made the band in the first place. Stephen two, three, and four chase him back. They get back to Stephen from earlier in the episode, who is quite confused by matters. They end up travelling back and forth the a lot, and we have a lot of Stephen on Stephen combat. <laughs> Stephen 1, or one version of him, figures the only thing to do is to stop this from ever happening by going right back to the beginning, meaning back in the undersea facility before he picks up the, t the time thing. He arrives to try to stop that earliest Stephen, then many other Stephens arrive, Far more than the other gems can count. They max out at 18. They're just kind of staring at the chaos around them. <laughs> a Stephen one realizes how this has just become him fighting himself and it's just no good for anyone and destroys the earliest version of the, the time thing, causing the various other Stevens to, well, then they disappear. They just kind of melt into water, which is. Slight, slightly gross. Before he does, before this Stephen one does so, he tells the present youngest extant Stephen to basically to not do what he has just done and then disappears himself. We then find that the band is formed anew from Stephen and the other three gems rather than Stephen and any other versions of himself. And they play out to a song about what Stephen got up to in this episode, including all the time travel, watching himself die and creating alternate timelines, which Pearl does note with some concern as she plays her violin. And as the 15 people at Beach of Palooza watch Stephen and the Gems play, we go to credits. <laughs> 15 so, people. Did you count them? <laughs> I tried to. It looked like roughly 15 before I could, yeah, before it it went to actual credits. I assumed, like in this, I assumed in this kind of show they wouldn't say that and then let us off with some rather random number. They like the detail. No, I didn't actually sit there and count them either, but I think if you count Stephen and Greg, who was not there, I think it would have been 15. But I could be wrong. <laughs> <sighs> yeah. They are a little tourist town, so... Yeah, and, well, they seem to be having fun. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's something we seem uh, to see a lot in science fiction of leaving us the message for the viewers at home that you shouldn't try to use time travel to change your personal history, which is a message we see a lot considering we don't actually have time travel. Yeah, yeah, that is a little peculiar. 
kind of leads into my first question here is like, as a Doctor Who fan, what your thoughts on the whole time travel thing were. So I'd love to hear it. In Doctor Who terms, I'm not sure we've ever seen so much nipping back and forth and yeah, in the space of in the story, what is a few hours and creating many duplicates and time remnants or whatever this series word for time travel created doubles is going to be. No one, even though we get the idea that you shouldn't change history at first, no one is worrying about bringing all the various Stevens out of their rightful time zones, whether this means you can't create damage like that or if it's just because they're, all, they're planning to be sent back anyway. I don't know. Uh, Stephen almost certainly hasn't thought about that hard, given his first thought upon meeting himself is let's form a band. Yeah. <laughs> now, obviously, we can change time because we have the the fire, which happens and then unhappens. And, of course, Stephen unhappens a whole bunch of duplicates of himself. And that's where it, that's where it gets nicely chaotic, as it does show that one of the problems with this kind of time travel is you can just compound what you're doing over and over and over again and yeah and i think i i did kind of anticipate that the solution once things started going awry was going to be to stop the problem before literally before it began and that would probably involve destroying the time thing uh, Mm -hmm. which doesn't seem to bother anyone if that was indeed the artifact they were searching for at the start of the episode Or well, maybe maybe they had to find it to dispose of it. So job done. Time thing got uh, destroyed in the pilot too. <laughs> yeah, it's just it's just obviously not a good thing to have around. Maybe yeah. this is like I said. Maybe the pilot is in fact a, another alternate time timeline created by a whole bunch of messing with time time things and mm-hmm. got uncreated. Mm-hmm. Speaking of pilots, we got. We got fun, we got funny wet hair from Pearl. I like that this week. Yeah, her yeah. hair isn't stuck into that backwards queer fit. For it just yeah. droops over her face. Yeah, Garnet's wasn't much different. <laughs> no, it probably if we could zoom in enough, it was probably beading on her hair. Just a soggy bread loaf. Yeah, and Amethyst doesn't look much different because she doesn't seem to actually do much to her hair each morning. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess technically in the pilot, Stephen destroyed his time thing. But yeah, I guess whoever had it would probably still have that timeline's version of it. I don't know. Hey. I'm still trying to figure that out. <laughs> yeah, or if it's got some kind of reset mechanism to quote unquote save itself, it gets destroyed. It rewinds itself back to a time before it was destroyed yeah. in another option or timeline or alternate. Mm-hmm. Amethyst is obviously very concerned uh, about responsible use of time travel being down for whatever with th- <laughs> three alternate timeline versions of Steven. <laughs> yeah. She's just like, yeah, yeah, I'll roll with this. And she was a drummer, which is not defying any stereotypes about drummers. Nope. <laughs> you are right. Yeah, I was wondering, too, what they were planning to do with the hourglass, why they were looking for it, and if they had plans specifically to, I mean, time travel device. That's uh, serious. That's a lot more implications for what that could have been than replicator wand, for instance. Yeah, so were they getting it because they're just trying to clean up artifacts we've seen before is it something they want to use is it something they had to retrieve and maybe destroy themselves to stop anyone else from using it and yeah. they got off lightly by the only misuse being a kid forming a band with himself and <laughs> having a having a fight yeah maybe a, a similar level of irresponsibility to using it for comebacks yeah <laughs> although in the pilot i guess they earl said something about that the uh, skull thing came after him because it could see the rips in the time-space continuum, which didn't exist in this episode. So, yeah, it worked differently because, as I noted mm-hmm. in the summary, you replace yourself yeah. in the pilot and here you go back and you see yourself. Mm-hmm. It's very interesting that that was the case because in the pilot, he kept collecting more donuts, but he wasn't running into himself. Mm. Uh, very interesting. Yeah, I mean, it could... It could just be 
it, it could be a simple rule of story that someone thought of that. What if Stephen has abandoned himself? Okay, it works this way now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. It ended up just in practice being more like being a duplicates episode more than a time travel episode. Yeah, there was kind of some time travel antics with how it was resolved and the, the fat boat stuff. Yes. <laughs> but really, I mean, there were dozens of Stevens by the end of all their various facial markings and hair quips and things. And the very earliest Stephen with his jacket on so we could tell him apart quite nicely. That's right. So Stephen we've been following is dead. Pretty dark. Yeah. <laughs> but it checks out. <laughs> yeah, well, it even says the episode, I watched myself die. I mean... You know, there's there's some angsty fan fiction out there where they're writing about the other timelines where there's no Steven now. Uh, yeah, if it works that way, then Steve, Steven may have discontinued himself and, well, who knows yeah. what may happen in future episodes if Steven's not there for them. Yeah. <laughs> sort of, really, most of this episode, when all was said and done, didn't happen because we went right back to the right back to the first scene. And so the only things that sort of happened in the final version of events were... The visit to the what they call what they call the undersea facility, sea shrine, sea shrine. The visit to the sea shrine and the playing the song at the end. Yeah, somebody cut together what the episode would be from our Stevens' perspective. It's like if the episode was just how the timeline settled, it would be just a few minutes long. <laughs> so that's pretty funny. Definitely, the larger mystery is what is. You know, what are any of these gem places really? But the sea shrine, what is it doing there? Who put it there? What are these other decoy hourglasses? What, you know, why does it reform every hundred years? Like, what's going on with it? It's just so much mystery surrounding the whole place. What are the other ones for? Why is it set up that if someone takes the wrong hourglass, that it collapses in on itself? Right. Uh, or, Or is that just something to do with that particular hourglass? Which Good Amethyst question. is like, well, I got my hourglass, so I'm fine. Mm-hmm. I, I really liked the way that manifested too, how each one of them had their own very characteristic hourglass. Garnet wanted the biggest, most imposing one. And Pearl is like, it's going to be something beautiful and grand. So she wants like the fancy, elegant one. And Amethyst, Amethyst just Jesus. wants the weird one. Yep. This one's janky. <laughs> It's shaped weird, and I just like it. And, of course, Stephen's, like, looking at the small, adorable one. He called it adorable. He's looking at the smallest, unassuming one with untold power inside. (laughs) I think that's kind of cute. Which means, despite his subsequent rampant misuse, this was a case of Stephen getting it right as everyone else blew off the idea. Well, Amethyst just didn't blow off so much as not pay any attention. Yeah, she didn't care. (laughs) Blew off the idea that this pocket size one could be the artifact they were looking for and had their own mm. elaborate criteria. So yeah. he could have done well if he hadn't then decided to form a band of himself. And yeah. that's all, all his Nungian's dad's fault for trying to stick a fat boat in a car wash. That's right. Why otherwise, does it need a car wash anyway? Otherwise, he probably was, would have soon enough forgotten about it. Mm-hmm. I like that sometimes it's Amethyst or it's somebody else who messes up the mission. It's not always Steven screwing it up. <laughs> yeah. And but she was completely unrepentant. She's just like, whatever. <laughs> yeah, and in fact, he didn't screw up the mission at all. There was everything subsequent to that. Yes. Right. <laughs> yep. Mm. And they all brought back a sea creature. <laughs> oh, yes. I was the first amused by the octopus or squid, whatever was supposed yeah. to be, sticking itself to Garnet's hair. Apparently, yeah, I'm concerned there. to her. Mm-hmm. Also, to Pearl, there is a lobster on your butt. Yes! Yes! Great line. So she had the butt lobster. And I've seen the model sheet for this lobster, and it's labeled butt lobster. It's really funny. <laughs> but of course it is. And like Stephen, after you with the little crab yeah, creature. Yeah, the little blue crab. He's after you, sir. I heard that they, I guess this is more accurately discussed in the factoid section, but it's relevant. They, they wanted to cut that little scene for time. And I don't remember who it was who said like, no, no, we've got to leave it in. It's just so cute. They used it in the commercial, too. It's so nicely random. 
And a few seconds before that, we see that Stephen has a cookie cat clock. We sure do. Cookie cat alarm clock. So even has all kinds of merchandise. Yeah. So even even if cookie cat itself is gone, Stephen Stephen's Stephen's fandom, Stephen's love of the cat of cookie remains. You are correct. (laughs) So oh yes, and Amethyst ate her fish. She had a fish in her mouth, and she just ate it. Yeah. Yeah. Because of course she did. I wanted to know what happened to the, like, they, sh- they should have taken the lobster and the octopus back out to the ocean, but nobody seemed worried about it. So maybe Amethyst just ate those two. So maybe they're living in the beach house's bath. <laughs> well, only Stephen needs to use that, so. Okay. Oh, well, maybe Amethyst decides they need to live in a thing in her quarters room. <laughs> oh, she's got plenty of little puddles, doesn't she? Yeah, so all kinds of creatures she's accumulated on her travels could have been let out in there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I liked Pearl's side eye when Stephen admits to creating alternate yes. timelines during the song, where yes. <laughs> which yep. I, I think is partly her being the stone growing up and partly her going, oh, that's what happened before. Because mm-hmm. from her point of view, all she knows is dozens of Stephens appeared, then disappeared. And she, I don't yeah. know if she saw the destruction of the time thing or if she put it together, but she definitely did during the song when Stephen said it in so many, or sang it in so many words. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yep. Which Amethyst, or one version of Amethyst, already knew about this and again did not care. Yep. I wonder what Amethyst did with her hourglass. I mean, I'm sure it's in a pile of junk in her room, but it kind of yeah. shed some light on where she gets some of those unusual things that are in those piles. Like she's probably been collecting junk like this from random missions for years. Oh, yeah. There's probably all sorts of. This this looks weird. I'm going to steal it. <laughs> yeah. Which might be this anything. Looks weird or appetizing. <laughs> which might be anything from powerful arcane artifacts to door stops. Mm-hmm. I'm sure, there's a treasure chest or two in there. Maybe a couple dead bodies. <laughs> but I mm. wouldn't be surprised if some artifact, which is one of the most powerful gem artifacts in all of gem history, has just somehow ended up buried in Amethyst's room under all this stuff. Seriously. I would not be surprised if that was a plot of an entire episode. Let's find this treasure. Where has it been all this time? Amethyst's room. Journey to the Sanford Amethyst's crap. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I really want to know what it is about shrines like reforming. They said that it it's going to reform in a hundred years and what would even be the purpose of that? Do shrines reform? Like, are we going to get the, the sea spire back? <laughs> is, is this is this something for, is this something particular to all gem facilities? Which raises the question that our heroes in some kind of lull in gem society, while the various buildings and things are slowly reforming over decades and centuries, and it's uh. part of what they're doing, stopping in on, half reformed shrines and spires and things to clean up any nuclear level artifacts that are kicking around waiting to be found. (laughs) This is, in fact, this is something that hasn't come up much except by direct intervention of our heroes of anyone else finding gem artifacts and their various powers. Mm -hmm. Uh, Normally, if some, normally if someone else gets a hold of it, it, something it's because someone usually Amethyst or Stephen, has lost it or passed it on to some unsuspecting human. But especially if a lot of these places are on Earth, presumably they could also be reached and, in fact, have been reached by conventional non-warping means. And someone just in in their boat or exploring or lost or something could find some powerful prehistoric rock, which lets, you know... lets them turn sculptures into monsters to do their bidding or something. Wow. I'd, I'd watch a Steven Universe episode that you wrote. <laughs> hmm. and until a few episodes ago, I had assumed all these other environments were on other planets or other dimensions or something. Mm-hmm. And I think some of them are because they just look far weird in any Earth place and actually have non-Earth mm-hmm. creatures on them. But we've now heard of such things where they've had to paddle back home or mm-hmm. it's it's just been referred to as another island or something and Sugalite stomping across the ocean uh, a few weeks back. Right. 
So until then, I hadn't re- realized that even if our gems usually get there by warp padding, I can't see why by luck or determination, some random Joe couldn't just wander in and possibly create more trouble, which maybe this is part of the reasons they have to clean up these artifacts before J random human grabs them and starts to decay the fabric of the universe or become a dictator or something. Mm, I think that's a very realistic worry because like I'm thinking about in the episode Rose's room when they were like, Oh, I have to go, we have to go get this whaling stone. I don't know what it, you know, what they were thinking it was going to do besides make noise, but like they didn't want somebody else to get it. And so as soon as they knew it was there, they're like, Oh, we have to go get it. The way Garnet said, a dangerous artifact has appeared in the Northern hemisphere, I think is what she said. So Mm, Yeah, in fact, that's what started to nudge me into the, oh, many of these places are on Earth, but Mm -hmm. difficult to get to. But in this day and age, there's nowhere that's really impossible to get to on Earth. Right, right. And like some of them, we have no idea where physically they are. Like if Lion teleported them there, they go to this, the place where the robot shooty thing is, you know. Um, So sometimes it's like nobody told us where that was. Yeah, so that could be across the ocean, that could be a pocket dimension. So sometimes we're just not going to know. Mm-hmm. I mean, we, yeah. we, know, we know pocket dimensions or things like them are a thing based on how their rooms work, if nothing else. Mm-hmm. And they've gone to the odd environment, which has like different colored skies and giant strawberries and <laughs> angry birds split into other angry birds. <laughs> yep. Mm. Yeah. So well, it's, it's I, become another ongoing thing of mine to work out what the gems, our gems kind of remit is, if you will. Yeah. Mm. I mean, the obvious potential for trouble of the, of the time thing. So. Mm-hmm. Right. Though I've read there is a genuine real life by smart people who are paid to think about these things, a theory that time travel will be or has been invented but because if you can change, if one can change time, it always ends up getting uninvented because someone does so much damage with it. The only thing they have any option to do is go back and uncreate it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, obviously it's com- widget- completely mm-hmm. unprovable, of course, but it is an interesting right. idea. I, you know, I've heard that kind of thing too. Like, if time travel had been invented, we would already have evidence of it, assuming that it includes traveling to the past because we would have seen someone who was a time traveler, but then other people are saying, well, maybe we have, maybe some of the things that we can't explain, you know, this is evidence, that is evidence. So I don't know, but yeah, I've definitely, I've definitely heard people say, you know, sciencey people they are like, if there was traditional sort of science fiction style time travel, we would have already met some, you know? So I guess it just doesn't work in the way that we're, fantasizing either that or they're being very careful and this mm-hmm. this episode we briefly popped back to to right before <laughs> the events this episode with uh, uh, Stephen Stephen reassuring the gems that he was in fact okay then vomiting <laughs> yeah, which yes which he's done before yeah they, they went back in back in time to episode one <laughs> when he's throwing up about cookie cat yeah so that that was a cute little nod for those of us who've been on board all this time. Yeah. Yeah. They, there was one little bit where they teleported into Rose's room, which just happened a few episodes ago. Ah, I did notice that. When things were getting very abstract before the many Stevens. Yeah. Yeah. They teleport into the pink clouds and stuff. And it's not just they're in a room, they're in a specific scene because, you know, it's one of those things that if you watch it a few times, you'd probably see all the stuff. But in the background, you can see him, you can see a distant Steven drifting down by parachute. And that happened in Rose's room when he was like, oh, I want a parachute. And he's drifting down. So that's during that scene. (laughs) He's in his own past. I did see the parachute. You're right so cool how they've done that and actually there's they technically also go to a future episode which you can't catch yet but they're using backgrounds from a future episode that they I, aren't I, telling I, about yet. <laughs> I can't immediately recall now if i had in front of you but there were, i remember there was a bit where i thought that's specific enough to be a thing but i know it's not a thing ah i bet you subconsciously caught it <laughs> yeah i can't remember exactly which bit it was but i, I definitely thought i think they're 
they might be laying down some track for uh, of them having popped into the future. Yeah. They don't have far to go before they show you what that's from. So it's probably like, oh, they've already done the backgrounds for these upcoming episodes. Let's just slide that in there. <laughs> it doesn't tell you anything. Yeah. Well, I like when a TV show does, does time travel and does peek in on its own past and future. Sometimes, mm-hmm. sometimes it goes deep, but sometimes it's also just to, as a nod to people who watch and rewatch that, yeah, this is their actual past that they popped into and... <laughs> You know, this is the the future. Yeah, they have done that trick. They have done that trick in Doctor Who, where once we briefly saw a version of the Doctor who hadn't actually otherwise shown up in the show yet, which was a a new idea at the time. Oh, that's cool. Usually, only usually only saw previous versions when they were dicking around of time travel, rather than any one we hadn't Mm. actually had as the star of the show yet. So that was that is cool. I like that. Of course, when we saw episode one, we didn't see any Stevens popping up and causing him to vomit cookie cat. So (laughs) no, but that's fair because when they travel in this one, they change things. So yeah, (laughs) exactly. Exactly. Now, usually with time travel, well, not really time travel, but usually with clone episodes by the end of the episode or by the end of the arc, the the whole thing is we have to find a way to get rid of all these, these doubles and stuff. I think, I think I just thought of a probing question actually. Oh, go on then. So let's say that if they didn't get rid of, like, I, I kind of thought the way that they usually do is just beat everybody and go back to status quo. That's how these things work is we'll have chaos ensuing with multiple Stevens and by the end there will be one again, one way or the other. Like, But if they had decided to flout those tropes and keep, say, four Stevens, like, how do you think they would do that? <laughs> Keeping four Stevens around. <laughs> I can, in such a thing, I can imagine the the band popping up now and again. So <laughs> yeah, whatever would happen to the other Stevens, so reunite them for musical occasions. <laughs> I can I can see in the short term, they the gems might try to just have four Stevens around. <laughs> I can see that getting old pretty quickly. Well, we saw how poorly Steven got on of himself. Right. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. I wonder if they would take like the band identities that Stephen, original Stephen, tried to push on them and like emphasize like this one's going to be the sensitive one. He's going to be the one that solves everybody's problems and plays therapist. And this one is the smart one, and he's going to go to school and you know <laughs> stuff like that. Yeah, I wondered that if if maybe they could send three of them off to do other things as as fits their assigned oh. role. So you know what? That one could, could be a way to get rid of him. <laughs> one could go to school because he's he's smart, and given Stephen's penchant for strange and unusual activities, uh, the funny one could go and become a comedian. The mm-hmm. sensitive one could, as you say, become a therapist or, or I don't know, a, a dial-in advice host or something. And the handsome one. <laughs> <laughs> well, he so he go back to being the main Stephen because, as Stephen will know, he's always the handsome one. <laughs> I love how they were actually acting like they were hurt. They're like, does that mean the rest of us are not good looking? <laughs> just so funny. Cute. Yeah, the, you look exactly the oh, never mind. Yeah. I like that they all thought the same way about who should be the leader, though. Because usually that's like a, a conflict in clone type episodes where they're like, who's the real one or who's in charge? And they're like, no, it's all him. We all think it's him. <laughs> Looks fair. Yeah, I, I, I too thought that, oh, this is going to be the moment where it turns into Stephen on Stephen war. But no, mm-hmm. the, then, of course, it turned into Stephen on Stephen and then some war. But yeah. When he realized he was annoying. <laughs> I'm so annoying. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, once again, he probably learns no lesson because most of the episode didn't happen to him. That's right. You know, again, I guess factoid area of the show that we're – I'm skipping to talk about this, but they talk about this episode in one of the official podcasts that the that the creators do. And when they talked about this episode, they they talked about it as being one of the first kind of tentpole episodes for the moving forward of Steven's character. And that he's like, it's kind of the episode where you realize he realizes he can be kind of hard to work with. <laughs> and it's like, but then how? Because that Steven 
evaporated into ash. <laughs> the one who learned that he was annoying. So I don't know how exactly that works out. And I guess the extant Stephen could have taken it on board from watching the last argument, but it usually takes mm-hmm. more than that for Stephen to learn something. Mm-hmm. Especially because he doesn't entirely know who all these other Stevens are at this point. Right, he's just like, something is happening and I don't know what, but a weird, handsome version of myself is giving me advice and telling me the boat's fat and kissing me on the cheek. I like how just before he vanishes, Stephen Prime, as it were, just becomes very suave and kissing himself on the cheek and speaking Italian. Yes. Zach Callison, who does the voice for Stephen, actually speaks a little bit of Italian. (laughs) <laughs> and he was excited to get to say Arrivederci in this episode. <laughs> yeah. During the episode, I didn't know if it was going to be resolved by a lot of duplicate Stevens disappearing or if they recombine, which is the other mm-hmm. way they sometimes do these things. Yeah. Random Steven fusion. <laughs> yeah. Which probably make him vomit again as he gets down a few days worth of extra memories in the space of a minute. Oh my God. Or shoved in. All shoved into his head in various conflicting versions. Oh, he's just so smart and funny and handsome and sensitive. (laughs) (laughs) It's interesting to see him kind of be the antagonist of the episode. He was kind of the bad guy. (laughs) He's really violent to his other selves. I've never seen Steven, like, punch another person. And he's punching himself. Yeah, maybe he thinks it's okay if it's himself. Or this is, he has some deep-seated self-loathing he needs to work out. Oh, my goodness. It was was a little disturbing. (laughs) Watching them, like, beat the crap out of each other. (laughs) So, hmm. So I thought I had a thought there, but it escaped. Oh, well. (laughs) Your thought escaped. Oh, my thought is still, why does a boat need a car wash? Well, yeah, I mean, that's one of the outstanding things, like, also, you're looking at it. Going, it's not like the boat was slightly too fat, <laughs> right? It's just how do they have these uh, spatial qu- like how how are they that bad at negotiating space? Space. I mean, even <laughs> even as people just looking at it could see that just doesn't fit in there. Mm-hmm. She'll definitely fit. Okay, does, Greg. Doesn't Greg have one of those dangly signs over the entrance? You know. With like max clearance 2.3 meters or whatever, or you know, eight feet. He probably had one and someone knocked it down. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Doesn't seem particularly sophisticated car wash. Yeah, well, the boat probably knocked it down and he probably looked at it and go, I can't see because the boat's in the way. Oh, well, yeah, it'll definitely fit. I also want to know what their act would have been if Palooza had went on as expected and it was even in Greg Universe playing. I want to know what they would have performed. Yeah, has he come up with any new songs in, in the past? Uh, how long it's been? Stephen's age plus a bit. It's a good question. So either they were doing old classics from the CD, or they were doing new stuff Stephen wrote, or maybe Greg has some some songs up his non-existent sleeve that yeah. he has not unleashed yet. Yeah. I realize Greg also defies this type of character in that he's not sort of clinging that he's going to make his next big comeback any minute. Mm-hmm. He's, That's right, yeah, you're right. He enjoys making music, obviously, maybe because it's a bonding activity with his son or maybe he just likes it or both. But he's obviously quite happy to run a car wash. Yeah, he seems settled at least. He doesn't seem like he's longing for the glory di- days and telling everyone you'll see one day I'm going to be a superstar finally. Yeah, he's, he's, he's obviously feeling better about it than Mr. Smiley. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's true. Yeah, he seems, he doesn't even seem like, I wanted to say resigned to it, but it's not even resigned. He doesn't act like he's even particularly upset about it. He's more just, it is with it. I was a musician, now I'm a car wash guy. These are different phases mm-hmm. in my life. And I am a dad. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm assuming that all of Steven's instrument learning has been from Greg as well. He played a bunch of instruments in this episode. Yeah, so it's not just ukulele. He's got he's yeah. got the skills and it wasn't hilariously bad skills. He's oh. competent to execute the early rock and roll, nice clean family music homage and yeah. some of the more angsty hard, hard rock 
and stuff. If this episode had been longer, I imagine we would have seen a lot more tongue-in-cheek attempts at various music genres. Oh, I would have loved to see that. Yeah. Yes. Seeing total goth emo Stephen in the Stevens, <gasps> that would have been hilarious. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, I would pay to see that. I would go make sure the Beast City went up to 16 people. <laughs> Let's see Beach Palooza. Get out, get out a flannel shirt and do grunge Stephen <laughs> in the Stevens. <laughs> It would have to be in a minor key. Yeah, well, he'd draw on some stubble with a magic marker. (laughs) Yeah. So we have seen him now play uh, drums and lead guitar and bass and all the singing. So that's cool. That's a lot of instruments. Yeah. So that's actually pretty pretty good for a kid of nebulous somewhere between 9 and 14 age. Yeah. And plus ukulele, that's five count, you know each of those guitars and and the drums and I, I can't I'm a little biased but I count singing as an instrument <laughs> but yeah well but, a lot yeah. of kids that age can't do any of those things so that's right apparently while he doesn't always learn lessons about personal responsibility music lessons he's quite accomplished that yeah seems to have it in the blood at least and mm. has a dad that probably uh, spend a decent amount of time with him learning. Yeah, I can imagine Greg bonding with, like, infant toddler Stephen over music and Stephen just kind of being like, yay! Oh, gosh. I need that episode, too. It's very easy to picture baby Stephen. Yeah. You know, what's interesting also instruments-wise is the gems were all playing instruments, too. Yeah, that, I know, it's me. Do it, too. Amethyst and drums, not so much a surprise, but no. Yeah, at first I thought they were going to be play, all playing their signature instruments, right? And they are not. No. Well, if I had to pick an instrument that Pearl, the character, would seem to have the most affinity with, not necessarily yes. Pearl the, or rather Pearl the person, rather rather than Pearl the character as a metafictional event, I can see her taking to the violin. Absolutely. And it's very Pearl, isn't it? Yeah. And Garnet had a keytar, which... She did. Seems, seems with her, the fit with her, just edging into a bit funkier than you think style. Yeah, early concepts for her talked about, her, like, trying to get her to seem futuristic. So I can, I can see I that. Can see that. There's still aspects of sort of 70s disco future about her. They're not yes. so... They're not so blatant as they might be, but you can see influences coming through. So if they had that sort of retro future idea about her, the Kita would fit. Yeah, I I feel like it kind of could stand in for a bass also, but, you know, a violin can't hold what a guitar can hold, so you need something that can do that. Uh, wait, was, was Stephen playing ukulele also while he was singing? I'm trying to remember now. Oh, oh. It might just still be on my screen. Oh. I've... I can't remember if he was just singing or if he had a ukulele at the end. Maybe not. Uh, here we go. It's just replaying on my iPad uh-huh. now. There's lots of singing. He's playing an actual guitar. Oh, he's, he's got guitar. So we don't have to worry too much about the actual body of the music. Because he has guitar. Mm-hmm. And there was no uke. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, he, 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 okay. he had the uke. He just didn't use it. Right. He was, on, he was on his back when he was scooting along. Oh. So... Yeah, that's where I wanted. Oh, it's his, it's his whole... So, in fact, there was probably his original intention that he would be playing ukulele if he took his oh. ukulele to uh, Beach of Palooza before all the fat boat and time travel shenanigans happened. Right. So, with, with his daddy, he would have been playing uke. Oh. Yeah. So, I imagine our universe senior and junior are sort of very much a sort of, a sort of sit-down act, if you will, you know, a duo, a duet rather than, you know, a band like the yeah. other examples we saw in the episode. Yep. And I can imagine Greg actually letting Stephen sort of take the lead of the music and... Oh, yeah. And s- supporting him with his own musical stylings. Yeah, I definitely think he would have been very content to have Stephen in the spotlight. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I've said it many times before, but I like the relationship between Greg and Stephen and mm-hmm. how... how there's little things, how they bond with each other and which piece through make it look like this is a real thing that could happen between a father and son mm-hmm. in slightly atypical circumstances, but mm-hmm. it makes their relationship look warm and genuine. 
Right. And also like, okay, Greg has to flake on Beach of Palooza, but it's not because he was irresponsible or he forgot or whatever. He just, he had something else that had to come up. And when Steven was angry, he wasn't mad at his dad. He was like, nobody likes you, boat. Yeah, yeah exactly. It, it was, he had to flake, but this was a, this was an actual problem. He had a boat stuck in his car wash. <laughs> yeah. A problem of his and Onion's dad's own making, but still an actual yeah. problem. Agreed. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you kind of have to deal with it. Otherwise, you can't continue to make money, at least. Yeah, and Onion's dad probably just doesn't want his boat just wedged in there all night either. Right. He needs to go fishing. Ironically, <laughs> one of the gems could probably... Tug it out, particularly Ghana. Yeah. Just yank it out. Throw I mean, it in the she water. Could carry a gigantic hourglass like that. She could yeah. pick up a boat. Yep. <laughs> now I want to see that episode. <laughs> just Garnet walking around with a boat in her hands. She can lift up the boat like that old Superman cover. <laughs> where he's lifting up the green car. Speaking of Garnet, we saw her shapeshift. Yes, not into a whole other form, but she did do a like a plastic man thing with her with yep. one of her hands. Sure did. That was as advertised by Pearl and Catfinger. She's like, we can change parts of our bodies, or we could do that. Womp womp. The changing parts of our bodies thing. The image that they used was a person with their hand being bigger and longer. So Garnet yeah. did that. Obviously, that's maybe she was thinking of that because that's a shapeshift Garnet is particularly adept at when the need arises. Mm-hmm. It's pretty cool. She would definitely be the hands-on one, being a hand gem. <laughs> so it's pretty cool. <laughs> the giant hands. And she's just like, okay, Steven is not running fast enough. I'm going to grab him. <laughs> My hand is not big enough. I will therefore make it bigger. Yeah. I mean, with Amethyst, yeah. she probably would have turned all the way into like a you know, dog copter or something. <laughs> Amethyst seems to like full body transformations. Yeah. She sure does. Yeah, I guess this is just something Amethyst is particularly good at or just far more readily does than the other two. Yep. The Garnet was the quick thinker in this case, and Pearl was just busy panicking. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think, and yeah, I mean, I know I said it, but the Sea Shrine, that was, that was an awesome design from, especially if we've seen so many temples and caves and things, and here we actually could see inside the shrine from without and also see the water around when we were inside. It was yeah. kind of all coolly, quote unquote, lit. Oh, have to wonder how, I mean, yes, it's all magic and everything, but if it forms every 100 years, how come the inside doesn't have any water in it? Like probably don't care about that kind of stuff, but Stephen was okay <laughs> with going in there. Uh, mm. I guess maybe, maybe it just they have a way to drain it. Could be. Mm-hmm. We probably wouldn't want it keeping too too wet with all those hourglasses because if you know, any hourglasses got damaged, then it's, it's all the sand wrecked. Yep. Mm-hmm. Assuming it's actual sand and not like, you know, bits of quantum or something. Uh, yeah, agreed. Mm-hmm. Learn to stay true to myself by watching myself die. <laughs> <laughs> So is that I've one on a soundtrack? That song. <laughs> what? Is that one on a soundtrack? Oh yeah, yeah. You know what's funny? They they also even put the noisy one in the middle is on the soundtrack. Ah. Which on the previous episode, uh, we were talking about how they don't have the the donut song. That maybe it's because it's fragmented like that. But they still put the the the. It's called Big Fat Zucchini. Incidentally, <laughs> Steven's a big fat meanie. A big fat mini zucchini. <laughs> Part of the lyrics. So they put all of that on the soundtrack. It's very abrupt, very loud. And it's between the two, Stephen and the Stevens and Stephen and the Crystal Gems. It's just between these two sweet little songs. I'm like, oh my gosh, my ears. <laughs> Maybe Zach was just too proud of his efforts performing with himself that he needed them to be on the, the soundtrack. <laughs> Definitely an unusual type of song for the show. So maybe they wanted to show off their guitar skills and stuff like that. And yes, the screaming. <laughs> mm. Spe- mm. Oh. Speaking of zucchinis, I don't think we got much, by the way, of food this week. 
Oh, tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I guess it was like very raw seafood, technically. <laughs> and that would be that would be my recipe. And uh, I did not make a fish. Okay, here's what I did for my recipe for this episode. I was admiring that Amethyst was able to have this fish in her mouth and just slurp it up. I'm like, okay, that technically counts as food. My, uh, of course, yes. My standards for like, is something food? It's not food if it's just some random object that Amethyst has eaten. But technically, fish is food. You wouldn't eat it like that. I hope you would not ingest an entire raw fish from the ocean. And she was but, probably eyeing off the butt lobster too. <laughs> I would not be surprised. Either that, or it would become her buddy. <laughs> yeah. I decided that since it's even if I did eat fish, it wouldn't be practical for me to try to eat it like that. I decided to try to duplicate kind of form of that rather than the actual substance. And I made, get this, I made fruit leather and oh. cut it into a shape of a fish that I could slurp up very quickly. And it did so the fruit leather was made of chopped up apples put in a blender and then some wild blueberries also put in a blender. You need <laughs> and that I blue poured it out. Yeah, yeah. I think the fish that Amethyst ate was sort of green, but I was like, eh, whatever. Anything will do. So I took the mess that I blended together and I poured it out on a on a parchment lion baking sheet and I baked it for a really, really long time at a low temperature, literally about five hours. So about halfway through, you turn the, the temperature down a little more, but you have to bake it for a really long time. But when I was done, I had this dried, nice fruit leather and I cut it into fish shapes and I slurped them up. It was funny. <laughs> <laughs> I can be amethyst. Excellent. Experience the slurping of the fish. I'll, I'll never um, cease to be amazed where you find an angle for food in a given episode. You know, I mean, I'm not going to completely reach for something. I'm not going to make food where there's no food. But incidentally, for this episode, the, the Crooniverse, when they were having their party for its release, they made zucchini and, and linguini as a reference to the song where they're singing about big fat zucchini and chop it up and serve it with linguini al dente. <laughs> that would have been so they, my, sec my second guess that you would have got like ah, a, cor a courgette and put a scowly face on it to be a mini zucchini. See, I've, I have not made this. And at first I was like, they just mentioned it. I'm not going to make this food, but now I'm starting to think I should totally make that because it was mentioned <laughs> sort of food in the episode. It's more food in the episode than eating a fish amethyst. <laughs> so I don't know, especially since the crew universe did it. I was like, maybe that's an overlooked episode that I really should have done coming up in future stuff. There's a couple things where I'm like, that sounds delicious. It was never in the show, but somebody said this out loud. So I made it. So there's a few that are like that. And I don't entirely have the excuse anymore to refuse to make something because it's only been mentioned. <laughs> so, I don't know. Maybe in the future I will make zucchini and linguine and serve it together. Mini zucchini. <laughs> me, oh, it's harder to say. Oh my goodness. It's a tongue twister. <laughs> oh. When I tried to cover that song, when I tried to cover the Steven and the Steven song, I don't play guitar. So <laughs> <laughs> um, I do own a guitar. And I majored in music, so I had to learn a lot of instruments over the course of my experience. I was a music education major, which means that you have to learn an enough of the instrument to be able to teach someone else how to play it. You don't have to become a virtuoso, but I learned a lot of instruments in a very short time. So I kind of developed the ability to, if I mess around with an instrument long enough, I'll figure out how to slop my way through some things. I did that quite a lot on... <laughs> I attempted cover on this. I used the guitar that I have that actually had a broken string and everything. It was like, I can't believe I tried to play something on this guitar. But I did it. That is the point. And even though Steven and the Stevens did not have their numbers on their faces yet at that point, I drew numbers on my face for the recording. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a ridiculous person. Because <laughs> uh, is the next step doing some elaborate video effects so you can do IV and the IVs. That's what I did, except I didn't call it that. I should have Ugh, missed opportunity. But I edited them together so that they were in the four windows, kind of like Brady Bunch style. Ah, and, cool. Uh, played this music with myself. Um, Excellent. 
So, and I made the, the main guitar part. I made it a ukulele part because I play ukulele, but <laughs> I really don't play guitar. <laughs> it's been a long time since I had drum lessons. So I just, I got through that. <laughs> I got an A in my percussion skills class. <laughs> so whatever, I can be amethyst. Mm. <laughs> But anyway, I have I have not covered Stephen and the Crystal Gems yet, but I'm not really sure because I don't own a guitar and <laughs> I'm not good at violin anymore. Oh, so I'm impressed because I can't musically anything anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's just not a skill I retained. Uh, I'm sure that there's quite a whole resume worth of skills that you have that I don't. So <laughs> we'll see if any of them pop up in the cartoon. Yeah, you'll have to inform me. Oh, yeah. So what would you vote when it comes to, should I make zucchini? <laughs> should I oh, do it? Oh, yeah, definitely, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, that's a vote one mini zucchini here. All right. Well, by the time this goes out, probably there will have been a happening of zucchini and linguini in my house. But at this point, I have neither zucchini nor linguini. I have been to the store today to get some really ridiculous ingredients that I'm making for an episode that you won't see for a billion years. But anyway, (laughs) oh my goodness, what is that episode like 114 or something? (laughs) That just, that just, I was going to say that just seems impossible, but now, but I remember when (laughs) double figures seemed a long way away, so. Oh yeah. And now we just did number 22. Well, you know, I mean, it won't be too much longer until we get to the mid season finale of this show. Ah. which is a nice, nice big deal coming up, but not quite yet. <laughs> oh, so let's see. So I told you about my oddly satisfying fruit leather that I can slurp. I told you about my music. I haven't told you about Factoids or Merc yet. No, I was about to suggest one of those. Uh, fact me. Facting. Facting will happen. All right. So let's see. I have in, let's see. I wrote down the tagline, which we like to read. Okay, Steven needs a musical partner for an upcoming show and uses a time travel device to recruit the perfect bandmate himself. That, I think that's too much. That's too much. <laughs> yeah, that's... <sighs> yeah. It was a way, way too much. You, you, could, you could just stop at saying Stephen needs, Stephen needs the perfect musical partner for an upcoming show. You could just stop it there because that leaves it open to all sorts of possibilities. Mm, yeah. Yeah, and being that the title is Stephen and the Stevens, it's like you already got the plot of this from that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, if you've got the title, then the raw idea of him creating a band for himself is not a total shock or anything. Right. Yeah, let's see. Okay, so did I mention to you yet that Jeff Liu and Joe Johnston are the storyboarders? Nope. I don't, nope. Think, I don't think I mentioned that. Okay. That's who did it. This is something that I heard on their podcast also, is that they were talking about how when they were drawing all those Stevens, when they were all fighting at the end, I think Rebecca Sugar said she drew like a pilot version of Steven there, and she wa- she wanted there to be a pilot Steven <laughs> in the crowd. I wondered if and... about that. I was <laughs> a little surprised at not spotting one. Yeah. Well, she wanted there to be a pilot Steven in there and she drew it in there, but it didn't make it to the final. And her story for why is that they use two different Korean animation studios for this show. And the one that animated the pilot was not the one that animated this episode. They didn't even know what that was. They just figured it was an off model Steven and drew him how he's supposed to look. So I guess that's how it happened. But it was originally intended that they were going to stick a little pilot Steven in there. (laughs) In the crap. I think that's really a cool factoid. The other one I heard is that Zach Callison had to do so much ridiculous voice acting for this because he had to voice all of those Stevens and perform all these songs. It was just a really intense voice acting episode. Oh yeah, I often wonder when that happens a lot for an actor how they how they keep their head clear, especially if they're playing different versions of the same character. Mm-hmm. Like when, a yeah. char- when an actor does entirely different characters, I can see that's probably easier to keep straight. But when he's like trying to keep straight, well, this is Stephen 1, Stephen 2, Stephen 3, and Stephen 4. And this is another Stephen 1 and Stephen 3 and Stephen mm. And this other Stephen who's younger than any other. Yeah. Oh, I feel like they were not all that distinct from each other, at least. So he didn't have to create whole new personalities for all of them. Yeah, so but, I suppose uh, when it came down to it, he didn't. 
if if he weren't as dedicated to his craft as we know he is, he could have simply just read the lines as they were. And, <laughs> but he he seems like the sort of chap who would at least try to keep a mental eye on which Stephen he is supposed to be given time. Oh, I think so. But plus they would have had to get like all the walla for the crowd of Stevens screaming at each other yeah, and punching each definitely. other and crying and all that stuff. So, oh my gosh, I don't even want to think about how much time that must have taken. <laughs> yeah, so someone heard his check this week. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That guy's in every episode, so well, technically. He is not in one episode, but I can't talk about that in detail yet. <laughs> I've read, I can't remember if I mentioned this on the show before, but I, I've read there are different rules for how you pay voice actors, whether they're playing separate characters or different versions of the same one. Oh, really? Well, there was on Transformers Animated because one of the characters, Starscream, cloned himself many times over. Oh, okay. They had different kinds of personalities. One was the coward, one was the ego, etc., etc. Oh, Okay. And on the toys, they all have separate names. Oh. The clones become separate characters. On TV, they're only ever called just Coward Starscream, Liar Starscream, etc. And someone asked one of the showrunners at a convention why are the clones never called by their other names on TV? And they said, because if we did, that would count as a separate character. And once you've done so many characters, we have to start paying them more. But if they're just all Starscream, 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 then it just counts as the one character. Wow. So as long as they just call them all the same character, then they get to bilk them out of money. I don't know if that's a global thing. So I don't know wow. if that would have applied here with Zach being Steven and Steven and Steven and Steven, etc. Uh, I guess it's a special situation anyway. So if yeah, they certainly, did it once. Certainly this would be an atypical situation. I don't know. Maybe they gave him extra craft services or something. <laughs> Have an extra croissant. <laughs> One of the writers, Matt Burnett, who he's kind of a troll, but he loves to say real questionable things on Twitter about the show. And somebody asked him about like, well, what was kind of the purpose of, of this episode if nothing really happened? And he was like, well, the point was time travel rules <laughs> and we thought it would be funny to kill our main character on screen like 60 times. <laughs> I, I could kind of agree with him, especially on the first point. And yeah, sometimes it is fun to just mess with the viewers like that. Yeah. It's like, how else are you going to get away with killing the main character? You better get as many kills out of it as you can. I really like Matt Burnett on Twitter because sometimes he would like people in general, I don't like trolls who are trolling on purpose to upset someone. But the way that he answered people sometimes was so funny. I think this is where the difference lies between malicious trolling and mm -hmm. just kind of messing about. Yeah. And he's not directing it at anyone. He's just sort of doing it in his capacity as a creator of children's yeah. entertainment. Right. Or if someone asks a question where they the answer kind of should be obvious, I guess. He would he would sometimes just say something really ridiculous. Like someone once asked, is is Stephen going to die at the end of the show? And he goes, yes, sad face. <laughs> <laughs> and, or, or one where, you know, they're talking about one of the episodes that features, you know, references to Stephen's mom and everybody wants to know more about her mo uh, his mom. And uh, so they, they asked Matt Burnett and they said, are we ever going to learn more about Stephen's mom? And he says, I don't think it'll ever come up again, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> like, of course we're going to learn more about his mom. It's like she's hanging over the living room, literally. Yeah. So, <laughs> Well, in fact, one of the aforementioned creators of that Transformers sequence answered a similar question like, no, no clone army in this show. <laughs> that's amazing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I, I think that's fine as long as just messing around and not, not hurting mm -hmm. anyone. And as for his first response about enjoying killing his main character, well, that might just also be true, so. Yes. Yeah. Also, sometimes, like, he's, this is a guy who works for the show. As far as I know, he's a straight white guy. So he's kind of like, he's used to a lot of marginalized people finding uh, a lot of meaning in the show he's writing for. So it was really refreshing to kind of see that he was the best kind of ally where he was kind of mean when people were expecting him to, 
make the show more mainstream, I guess. So one of the common things people seem to be saying is just like, well, you know, the gems are ladies. So how about a male gem? And it's like, well, his name's Steven Universe. So you have a male gem and he's the main character. What do you want? And then they're like, no, 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 we want like male gems. We want to have, you know, they're, they're all like badass superhero and they're all women. So, and he's like, I'm just, you know, every time somebody asks me for male gems from now on, I'm just going to send them a link to buy the Avengers on DVD. <laughs> <laughs> Stuff like that. Admittedly, it's just I did nice wonder. that he's sick of it too, you know? <laughs> yeah. Admittedly, I did wonder if there were male gems out there, but that was as much on the basis of only having met three. Right, exactly. So, you know, but I mean... But I wasn't going... The main they, character. Yeah, I wasn't going, there need to be male gems. I don't want oh, all yeah. these ladies on my TV. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I mean, if you hear Rebecca Shager talk about the show, it's kind of like she's very aware that the especially the shows that she grew up were very gender segregated. They're like, these are boy shows. These are girl shows. And there wasn't a lot of crossover and that the ones she liked were, were the ones that were for boys. And she grew up feeling like, why, why are they telling me that I shouldn't enjoy this? And I feel weird about enjoying this. Like I'm not supposed to. And, you know, so she wanted, she wanted to have something that had the dynamics that she liked, but could also be, easily marketed also to girls and you know they're not as gendered as they used to be like gender segregated in the way cartoons are but they really really were in the 80s which you know too but. well yeah being, being a transformers fan that is very <laughs> much a quote-unquote boy show and right especially back then almost all well the same question was asked about female transformers as male right. gems as to surely there must be some out there which Granted, there at least are. in the case of female Transformers, they were. Yeah, forget the specifics, but I know that they kind of do the thing that always seems to happen with making a lady version of something kind of late after you realize you should have in the first place. And it's like, well, we'll, we'll give her a lady voice and we'll make her pink and we'll somehow try to, if it's possible, yep. make her pink boobs, <laughs> even if it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> it's a reptile, it's a robot, but it has boobs. Yeah, yeah. I just listened to someone revealing shocking dinosaur cartoon tie-in from oh, God. from about the turn of the century, I think. And one one of the one of the reviewers is a woman, and she was commenting on this guy's the leader, and this guy's a smart one. This one is the girl. Exactly. One of my friends' term for that is girl guy. It's like the smart guy, the leader guy, the weapons guy, and the girl guy. <laughs> it usually meant that. The favorite character was the favorite female character was almost always if they introduced a second one because they used all the stereotype female traits on the first one, which meant mm-hmm. to differentiate the second one, they could make her like an actual character. Right. Yeah. Once their uh, personality was not limited to girl. Of course, uh, in a lot of these shows, when you have more than one female character, like they'll always be tempted to have them, their storyline be focused on fighting over a boy. Yeah. So, oh. That's annoying. Now we're, now we're talking about other stuff. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Back to this show that's full of, <laughs> full of gem girls. <laughs> yeah. So I guess that's refreshing to see, especially from a straight male writer that we want to, we want to have front and center something that's at least upsets that balance and has something that goes the other way but it's not it's not even like the lady version of what we what we all grew up with with these male dominated shows it's not even like a girl version of that it's much more balanced still but fine to be like we want the majority of our superhero team to be these ladyish characters yeah and the only time that was kind of mentioned as their femaleness sort of being a thing in universe was in fact not technically in universe because it was in the pilot when right. Lars was describing them as hot chicks or something. That I, hot girls, so, you're right. You're not exactly a hot girl. That's right. <laughs> Whereas later, it's, I mean, it's not like people don't know they're women, but mm-hmm. moreover, they're, they're just seen as superhero come magical, come pizza shop destroying beings. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <sighs> Very well described, I would say. <laughs> 
So I guess I have a question for you because I think that you probably catch a lot of these more classic movie references than I do, but I've seen some people say that there was a Indiana Jones vibe to that picking the right object thing at the beginning. Is that a Indiana Jones movie thing or do you know? Uh, I think I know what they're talking about. I'm not like that with the Indiana Jones movies, but they're probably thinking of one of the sequences where Indy has to, there are a few sequences where he has to get the right thing. And also there's a mm-hmm. particular sequence where he has to pick up an item just so in order to not mm-hmm. set off traps and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And in fact, the entire opening could be a reference to that as Stephen manages to correctly grab his time thing, but Amethyst just yanks hers out and collapses everything around her. Mm-hmm. So right. I think it, it's that kind of vibe, you know, get the artifact, the O part, the miracle object and get it in the right way because everything else is a trap. So it's Indiana Jones, but I think it's also a general thing that Indiana Jones just kind of codifies. Right. I think the one that I heard was that it had something to do with the Holy Grail or something. And there was, it was like the direct comparison was that the the right Uh, one was an unassuming, like, like a wooden cup or something. And definitely, yes, that is, that is a good comparison. That's, that's, but I haven't seen the movie, so I don't really know how it goes, but. Yeah, essentially. they're looking, for, yeah, they're looking for the Holy Grail, the one Jesus would have used at the Last Supper. Uh, huh. And one person thinks, oh, Jesus was the King of Kings, so his goblet will be elaborate and amazing, and it'll be this one. And Indigo, oh. and Indy's like, no, for, for all of that, when he was around, Jesus was like a common carpenter's son, so he would have just had this basic, as you say, unassuming cup. So, mm-hmm. yeah, it's very very much like that, I guess, when... Stephen does get the the basic item and the others assume it's going to be something elaborate because it's just on the basis that's an impo- it's an important thing. And apparently they don't know anything else about it other than it's an important time thing. They don't even get a picture or description, I guess. Right. Like, again, why, how are they getting this mission? Why do they, how do they know that they want it, but they don't know what it looks like? <laughs> so weird. I think with the Indiana Jones thing, I just had that, question because there were definite references that even I got from back when oh like the temple in Sirius Stephen kind of had some indie type stuff going on so. yeah and I can definitely see some genre overlap especially in those those episodes of Stephen Universe yeah uh, because in indie being that kind of uh, temple raiding treasure hunting character yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah they even call them temples sometimes yeah <laughs> I see. Okay. Which also raises the question, is there a kind of gem religion or are they, they just calling them temples because that's the best word for them? That is something I've wondered too, because especially early on, it seemed like so much stuff was kind of borrowed from known mythology that some of the language that they used to describe it was very almost religious. And so shrine, shrine is a religious term and Pearl even had a moon goddess statue, you know? moon goddess so yeah that's that's they're a gem goddess that's the moon like wait earth's moon i'm confused <laughs> like so i don't yeah, know and temple usually yep. indicates some kind of place of prayer or worship absolutely i mean who knows if it's just kind of it's the language of a special place that that's what yeah. they had to work with at the time when they were making these plays. I don't know. Yeah, well, <laughs> I don't have the answers. Well, that brings up gem, gem language too. Sort of. So are these people really speaking English or are they actually speaking gem speak? And one of their powers is passive translation. And it just sort right. of picks the best word sometimes. Yeah. Hmm. The last little factoid that I can remember is completely unrelated to what we were talking about, and it was just that I heard that censors said to make sure to put a helmet on Stephen while he's on the scooter. <laughs> yeah, I remember, I, I remember we saw that before as well when he was trying yep. to ride the bike. Yep. And, yeah, I didn't have a problem with that. With yeah, I think kids, it's cute. It's a, well, and also, it's a, if really the point is to tell kids it's better to protect their heads when they're riding around, really, that's not a bad thing. Yep, Yeah. And when you're time traveling, then just be safe. Yeah, because <laughs> that's the other mm. message, apparently. <laughs> this. Yeah. Mm. The ridiculous adventures that he goes on are not likely to be things that the kids will encounter, but riding a scooter will be. Brand spanking new, mint inbox. I'm looking down at my merch down there. 
Should I show you what it is? Yes, yes. Are we ready for merch? Let's see the merch. Okay. This is what I came up with for merch for this episode. I still try to make them somewhat related, which I might not be able to do after a while. But um, I have a set of cute little socks. Ah. <laughs> and I brought these out because they're all Steven. So it's kind of Steven and the Stevens. Here's a star <laughs> one. It's, they're all from the same set. So they come together. There's a Steven star. And there's one with Steven's cute little head. Ah. And there is a classic Steven shirt sock style. Ah, beautiful. And another grinning Steven head. <laughs> well, that, that actually looks kind of scary because it's Kate. The side you're showing me is half caved in, so it looks like he's doing a weird grimace. He there we go. Kind of is. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess it's, I guess if a real person tries to replicate a Steven Universe smile, it does kind of come off as creepy. Yeah. Oh yeah. But if I pick these up and they're like children's socks, but I have little feet, so I'm very fortunate. But it comes in this four pack, so it's Steven and the Stevens, and they're all Steven-y. They're not Excellent. like the four Dems, they're <laughs> four Steven. So so I'm showing my socks and that sounds weird. <laughs> I'm I'm currently wearing socks, but they're not Steven Universe socks. They just have a little heart on them. <laughs> yeah, mine, mine are just mine are just boring and black because I'm working out after. <laughs> I see. <laughs> I usually wear black socks to work too, but sometimes I wear Steven Universe socks. <laughs> mm. a, f- a friend of uh, mine's a huge sock, strange sock fan, so she'll be pleased. That's so cool. I actually usually wear mismatched socks, so sometimes I'll wear two different gems. <laughs> now that's cool. I have other sock sets that do have a variety of gems on them, so there's quite a few sets that have come out, or sports socks that have Steven stars on them. It's quite a lot. <laughs> so it was fun. <laughs> and these are little ankle socks, so no one knows but me that I'm wearing them. Cute. Mm. I don't think many people would be too surprised if they caught sight of them. Certainly not. No, today I, when I went to the store to buy obscure items for my Steven Universe cuisine that I'm making tonight, I rode my bicycle to the store. I was carrying a Steven Universe-related backpack and also wearing a Steven Universe shirt. And I paid for the groceries out of my Steven Universe wallet. <laughs> so, might be a theme. Yeah, that's often me of Doctor Who stuff. I've, I've occasionally had to sort Great. of... <laughs> occasionally I've wondered if I've gone on too much because I've got like my Doctor Who t-shirt under my Doctor Who hoodie. I'm wearing yeah. a Doctor Who hat and not even realizing I'm doing all this. And I indeed yep. have a Doctor Who wallet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's a familiar feeling. Hmm. You know, and then I get to work and I'm drinking coffee out of my Steven Universe mug and I have several Steven Universe toys sitting on my monitor and all that. So one of my coworkers has noticed that I have toys and he's asked about them a couple of times. And uh, now he refers to it as Steven's Universe. (laughs) That was what I first thought it was way, way back. Mm -hmm. Like when all I kind of knew was a title of a show out there. Mm-hmm. It's weird how a lot of times um, the adult in a child's life will mispronounce their favorite things, like the Pokemans. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so my older coworker is being a weird grandpa and talking to me about Steven's the universe. Yeah, I used to screw up Peppa Pig's name. I knew you did what? Peppa Pig. Is she a oh. thing over there? I do know what that is, yes. Yeah, but I would just forget what. Pepper's actual name was. So I'd keep calling her things like Penny Pig and Penelope Pig. Oh. <laughs> finally got impressed on me what the name of this internationally successful multi million pound franchise was. <laughs> mm. <sighs> it, it occasionally occasionally boggles my friends with children because when there's a popular kids thing, of course they're just hearing about it twenty four seven. So that one of their friends can live in this world where it's just something they're aware of, but they can't quite remember properly. It's just strange to them. Right. They they couldn't they didn't they f- couldn't comprehend that I hadn't heard Baby Shark until a week ago. <laughs> oh goodness! Oh, Baby Shark. Well, my sister, who has a six-year-old, asked me if I knew what Baby Shark was, and I was like, "Yes." <laughs> <laughs> so I don't have a legitimate reason for knowing <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but somehow it has crossed my path 
Yeah, I knew um, what it was, mostly because of people going, oh, my kid's a bleeding baby shark. But I hadn't actually yeah. heard the infectious tune itself until very, very recently. And we're probably not even in the era where it's really a thing anymore. So mm. sometimes stuff yeah. just... Sometimes stuff just passes me by. Yeah, same here. You know, having having a young nephew, I mean, he's six years old now and he's in school, so he's getting exposed to all the stuff that his friends are into as well. And, you know, so he'll get into something like Ninjago or something and that's what he's into. And now I, you know, I get to hear about this thing that I had no idea really about it. And there's a lot of shows out there that are very popular with the same age group that if he doesn't discover them, I probably won't discover them. <laughs> <laughs> One of my friends told me not to tell her son I'm doing a Steven Universe show because she doesn't want him into yet another cartoon. Oh, well, uh, I feel that Steven Universe transcends all other rules about cartoons and it should be an exception if there ever was one. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in her case I kind of get where she's coming from because her six-year-old is it has to like mega fan everything as soon as they get into it and so every show they hear of they want all the dvds and all the toys and they have to have it on all the time mm. and it's just not more they'll they'll just play the same stuff again or demand more so i i think he should be in the steven universe but i can kind of understand his sure. mo- mother's wish not to not to hear nothing but we are the crystal gems 24-7 <laughs> while she's trying to work or sleep. Yes. Well, thankfully, there are plenty of songs in this show. <laughs> mm-hmm. And um, I'm in a pretty good Facebook group for adults who love Steven Universe. And a lot of them, of course, have children and talk about watching it with their children or that their children got them into it or something. And a lot of them will say stuff like this show is such a relief because it's not like a lot of the other things my kids like, and I legitimately enjoy it. So it's, it's nice to have something that we can get excited about together or we'll both enjoy it. If we see someone walking around in a pearl shirt or something. (laughs) So I am biased. So I am always going to think that, this is the show everybody should make an exception for. Yeah, and I, I do hope to sort of catch some of my other friends' kids watching the show, which I know they do from time to time, and just sort of see how they react to it just as just as child viewers, mm-hmm. which is quite possible because yeah. some of my friends, when I go around, their kids are just watching TV in the other room most of the time, so it wouldn't be unlikely that that would happen. Mm. Sure hope it's not a spoiler. Oh, <laughs> good point. Yeah. <laughs> it's very easy to get, you know, I was watching a reaction to the Steven Universe movie last night while I was trying to finish some drawings. And so I'm like, I'll just put this on. And these poor girls were trying to watch Steven Universe movie and they were unspoiled and they were going to, but they, they were watching a version that it was already in progress. Like they tuned in late and they were going to start it from the beginning because they had Hulu live or something, but they were basically like, they were aware that as soon as they turned it on before they could stop it and bring it back to the beginning, they were going to see whatever was on screen. And it turned out to be like probably the most spoilery possible image. And you know exactly what it is when you see it. And they were like, Oh my God. Oh my God. (laughs) Like they both just screamed in complete dismay because it was unexpected and completely obvious what it was. And it was like, what, oh my gosh, why did I have to pick this moment to turn on my television? <laughs> so. Yeah, I've had that. I w- when, I, when I tried to watch Babylon 5 completely unspoiled when it was already Uh-oh. a few years old, and I almost managed it until a novel from an entirely unrelated franchise decided to include a character talking about it. No. So I, I couldn't even guard myself because I had no reason to think I would encounter someone mentioning the show in this fictional book, let alone butting out a major plot point. Yeah. I don't know. I feel like that's, uh, it's not like it's Star Wars and it's decades old now where you're spoiling someone about Darth Vader's real identity, you know? Mm. It's not like, you know, the Titanic sinks at the end, you know? It's yeah. not like that. So, I don't know. Seems unfair. But at the same time, you know, 
the longer you wait to watch something, more the more likely you are to get spoiled. Yeah, it's just a sad fact of time sometimes. Yeah, well, too bad we can't find our own time things and go back before you got spoiled on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I've often wished I could unremember stuff to watch things afresh. Yeah. I thought about whether I would want to do that with this show because it is great to be able to be surprised, but I think I'd like watching it with uh, a lot of perspective as well. Yeah. So what, what you would be able to do now that you couldn't have done the first time around was because you could watch base, you could basically binge all of it unknowing. Mm-hmm. Like you, you wouldn't be broken up into hiatuses and year-long breaks and yeah. ch- checking for release updates. Oh yeah. So there must be someone out there who's who's been able to do that and has just kind of had their mind blown at their yes. own pace. We see them wander in on Reddit every once in a while, and they're just like, "I don't know what to do with myself now. <laughs> <laughs> I've just been through five seasons in a movie. What do I do?" And of course, they don't know how to handle the hiatus. They're like, okay, there's more coming, right? Well, when? No, when? (laughs) I was only 50-something episodes in when I got to that point. So I learned real fast. (sighs) But I got to binge the whole first season. I got to do. (laughs) So (sighs) have we covered all we wish to cover on this episode? (laughs) You know. Stephen and the Stevens. um, just looking at my little notepad here where I wrote the tagline down and it ends with a bullet point saying that my merchandise was the Steven socks so I wouldn't forget. So that was the last thing. Mm. <laughs> that and finding out your opinion on whether I should make linguini and zucchini. Yeah, so. well, that's a, ro- that's a roaring yes here. Okay. Well, I like, I like zucchini a lot. <laughs> I like it sometimes too, so, and sometimes I like linguini, so there's a double mm-hmm. vote there for you. Mm-hmm. I think I'm going to have to do it. <laughs> Rock on. Oh, no. <laughs> Delicious food. Please, no. <laughs> so if I've done it by the time that we process this episode, maybe I'll. <laughs> so I guess that means un- until next time, if you're there at home, want to make their- your own zuc- mini zucchini linguini. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. There you go. That's something you can write write in to tell us about your own efforts at making the food we've seen so far. <laughs> oh, goodness. Well, there are a few that are going to get pretty elaborate, and I'll be very impressed if anybody is moved to do them. <laughs> but, uh, fruit leather fish. Now, that's, uh, that's a time investment, five hours of baking. Yeah, that I was impressed by, because I had kind of assumed you were going to get the fruit leather like, <laughs> pre-made. Oh, yeah. I, well, I, if you're not trying to be a weirdo and make fish out of it, then you're supposed to cut it into strips and roll it up. But, you know, like fruit will oops, but that is not what I did. So. Yeah, yeah. I case you have to remember how deep dive you love to go on your homage cuisine. Yeah. But so far, I've just bought my own donuts. So, <laughs> so haven't quite gone there yet. We'll see. <laughs> well, that guess, wraps it up for me too. Yep. So until next time, gentle viewers and listeners. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time. Bye. You've been listening to Ivy and Daria on Not So Giant Women. You can find episodes of the show in video form by looking up Not So Giant Women on YouTube or in audio form at anchor.fm slash not so giant women or your podcatcher of choice. You can also find us on Facebook. Audio production by Daria. Video production and music by Ivy. Daria can also be heard on Podsploitation, the Ozploitation podcast. And Ivy at her Steven Universe fan blog at love-takes-work.tumblr.com. Steven Universe was created by Rebecca Sugar and remains property of Cartoon Network. No infringement is intended.